Hi, I'm Jerry Tartaglia, and I'm here at the 68th Berlinale to show my film Escape from Rented Island, The Lost Paradise of Jack Smith uh, in Forum Expanded. It's a non-documentary document, a film essay about the aesthetic and work of Jack Smith presented without any talking heads to tell you what to see. How can I get some coffee? How can I get some coffee? Does anybody have any coffee left over? Somebody, someone must go for me for coffee. Who wants to? Oh, good, thank you. But there's nothing in here. Exactly. Uh, I, I need, I need uh, an exotic volunteer of the desert of cheerfulness. Come on. Uh, it, it has to be uh, black with one sugar. Okay. Thank you. Hello, welcome to the 32nd Teddy Award. I'm Jean Bourboubac and I'm here to discuss the film Escape from Rented Island by Jerry Tartaglia. Hello, welcome Hi. to the festival. Thank you. Um, so the film is about the art, the lyrics and the aesthetic of Jack Smith. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a bit more about him and his role in the queer cinema? Sure. Jack was a filmmaker and photographer and performance artist who lived uh, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He's also called the granddaddy of performance art. Uh, he really invented uh, this genre. And he used in his performances uh, some of the 16 millimeter film that he shot, along with slides and uh, photographs and also live action. And the films uh, the film material that he used um, became very uh, deteriorated because he would constantly recut it. Oh, I see. Um, and uh, I worked for um, a very long time uh, on restoring those films and getting that film material mm -hmm. together. And I made this film, Escape from Rented Island, The Lost Paradise of Jack Smith, in order to pair some of the film images with uh, soundtrack recordings that he made um, to give an idea of what his aesthetic and uh, outlook and politics were about. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about, about this um, process of taking care of his heritage? Mm. You mentioned that you restored many of the films, yeah. so you worked on the preservation of them, also making it pu public, making it accessible again. Can, yeah. can you tell us a bit about yeah. this? Well, Jack, Jack never really um, developed a good career. Yeah. And he, um, uh, he was something of a recluse and a somewhat crazy person. And mm -hmm. um, his films were not seen very much outside of New York. Um, and when he died, the material was in a state of deterioration. Yeah. And what I had to do was um, clean the material, the film material, and re-splice everything that he had done during these performances, um, and then make new internegatives and eventually digitize the work. This was first accomplished through the Plaster Foundation, which was a sort of a, a non-existent foundation that basically raised money by showing the films and then putting the money into uh, the restoration. And then later, the Gladstone Gallery in New York purchased the whole estate from Jack's mm. sister. And um, then they asked me to uh, complete the restoration and digitize the work. And yeah. of course, they had the means to yes. accomplish this. Right, I see. Um, the film is a film essay or an essay film, mm -hmm. um, which is a very particular form, mm -hmm. maybe within the documentary genre. Yeah. I don't know if you would agree with yeah. that. Yeah. Um, what draws you to this particular form? Mm. Because you work with, with essay film. Yeah, quite often. There, were, there, was, there was so much writing about Jack Smith's work yeah. that seemed to miss the point 
where he would only focus on one or two of his films and, uh, and not see the bigger aesthetic issues that he was dealing with. Um, so after I finished the restoration, I thought, I don't know. And um, I was able to, um, through the generosity of Barbara Gladstone, uh, have the right to use the material. Yeah. And uh, I did a short uh, and small Kickstarter campaign and got some new software. And I put together 21 chapters, each of which I think um, uh, uh, reveals some aspect of his aesthetics. For instance, the art of failure and the need to be able to fail, or how the rehearsal of, a, of an action is itself the performance. And uh, I gave examples of each of these, and the only voice we hear is the voice of Jack Smith. Yeah. We don't hear any experts telling us yeah. what to see and think. And um, uh, I call it a film essay and a non-documentary document. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very fitting. Mm. Um, and I was actually wondering, because this way that you really go deep into the work, one artist and you solely work with, with, with the material that he shot and mm -hmm. that belongs to his vision in a way, but you create something new and by putting all these different segments together, mm -hmm. you are able to sort of reflect upon and, and uncover new meanings yes. through that. Would you consider this maybe a particularly queer way of storytelling or, <laughs> or, or a form of queer art? Um, I'd consider it a uh, form of uh, queer cinema criticism. Okay. Okay. So uh, we, I hope, will one day reach the point at which we are not reading critical commentary yeah. on cinema, but we are watching it. Uh, so it, I, uh, I see it as connected to um, more of uh, the critical history uh, yeah. than to um, the formal history. Yeah. yeah. So, so this historical aspect that that really interests mm -hmm. you, yeah. clearly, with like going through this work as well. Yeah. Um, how do you see? Because, because Jack Smith is a very like major. Um, filmmaker mm -hmm. within, let's say, underground queer cinema. Yeah, yeah. How do you see his influence on, on later developments of, of queer cinema? Mm, uh, vast. Vast, okay. Vast. Uh, he had, uh, had a vast interest. Um, uh, when you watch a Jack Smith film, and I hope you get some of that in, yeah. in my film, Certainly. you feel a, um, a sense of possibility. Yeah. You know that you could you can actually put on a mermaid costume, yeah. and go out into the meadowlands of New Jersey, yeah. and you can be transformed into something else. And his cinema is really about that transformation. Yeah. And um, as a as a viewer, if we if we watch the work attentively, and just give ourselves to it, um, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Uh, we can begin to feel that sense of transforming yeah. that, that he's communicating. Yeah. Now, I was also wondering, because working so closely with someone's art, it mm -hmm. also means that you developed probably a quite intimate relationship with, with this material that you worked with. Mm -hmm. um, and how, I, I was just wondering, how did it feel on a personal level to like really mm -hmm. dive into this rich and, and very complex material. Mm. Um, well, I should preface this answer by uh, telling you the uh, story of my first encounter with Jack Smith. Please do. And that is, um, I was familiar with his uh, film, Flaming Creatures, and some of the early underground works when I was in my 20s yeah. in New York. And I worked in a film supply house and one of the materials that they sold was called Phil Leader, and it was picture material, <clears throat> but it was used in a soundtrack in 16 millimeter just to fill up the space. Yeah. Today, in, in our timelines in video, we would say it's, it's uh, video black, okay? Um, 
and it was just junk film that uh, the film laboratories would discard. And I would always sort of go through it and look for interesting images to make found footage film. And uh, one day I saw the smiling face of Francis Francine looking back at me yeah. through the movie scope. And I thought, oh, this is great. I have a print of Flaming Creatures. And I looked closely and no, it was the original of Flaming Creatures that Jack had lost track of. And um, I, uh, I didn't, I never even met Jack Smith, so, but I knew someone who knew him, my friend Rafik. And Rafik took me uh, to Jack and I gave the film back to him. And that was the beginning of my relationship with Jack Smith. Um, after he died, um, Jim Hoberman and Penny Arcade uh, retrieved all the film material and the photographic negatives and so on. And they acted as the custodians of that material uh, for Jack's sister, who actually was the heir, uh, until Barbara Gladstone bought the estate from them. Um, but it was very um, uh, intense. <laughs> Yeah. looking at this material and sort of giving up my own vision of cinema and embracing what Jack thought and really trying to understand that he wasn't a complete madman. Yeah. He was editing this film material in um, a, a very um, uh, challenging way. And I got to see how his mind, his visual sense was working. Uh, in dealing with this material. Yeah, right. Now, so you worked really hard on, on preserving mm -hmm. this heritage. And I was wondering, because film preservation is something that, uh, especially in like well-established film heritage institutions, mm -hmm. it mainly concerns, well, let's say, a heteronormative cinema. Mm -hmm. And very often, the queer registers of cinema and, and the yeah. queer cinema in general is, is a bit pushed, shed pushed into the, aside. Pushed, pushed yeah. aside, yeah. yeah. Um, how do you see the present of the preservation of queer cinema? Mm -hmm. And what do you think, how could this develop into a more positive direction? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, obviously, to preserve the material now um, uh, before it completely deteriorates yeah. and is gone, and to collect the um, obscure uh, filmmakers. Um, I've, I've always said that exhibition is preservation. preservation. And uh, there were so many uh, queer filmmakers from the past whose work I think the average audience is unfamiliar with. Uh, someone like Tom Chamont, yeah. you know, uh, did amazing films that deal with sexuality and the spirit of the human being. Um, uh, Roger Jacoby, who um, engaged in his own film processing, all right, and created amazing kinds of imagery while dealing with queer content. Um, these films need to be first preserved and made internegatives and then digitized and exhibited, most importantly. Yeah. And I would say um, exhibited for money. All right. yeah. uh, the free show, uh, I think, is unfair. Um, okay. I think uh, curators are paid for their hard work in putting work together, and filmmakers, especially the poorer film artists, uh, deserve to be paid as well. Yeah, I see. But we, we talk about basically queer history here. Mm -hmm. Like this is very important for, yeah. um, for a generation that's just growing up and, yeah. and, and facing the issues of, of being queer. So how do you see what would be the role of the community itself within, mm -hmm. within I don't know, preserving queer film yeah. heritage? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Finding ways of coming up with the means, yeah. the uh, and and doing it economically, so that there's not a waste of resources. Yeah. Um, certainly, there needs to be money, and there needs to be uh, archival preservation, but also exhibition. 
And I think that uh, some of the gay film festivals could become even more daring with their, with their own audiences and uh, push the uh, push the limit of what the audience would expect, which yeah. would be mostly narratives. There seems to be like a really big emphasis on on exhibition mm. when when you talk about this issue, which. I think is super important indeed. Mm -hmm. So do you think that uh, film festivals have a major responsibility mm -hmm. in, in doing this work? Because mm -hmm. yeah. these are great exhibition yeah. platforms. Yeah, well, I would say in general, curators have the responsibility because yeah. it's the curators of the festivals and of the museums yeah. and the galleries and all the venues yeah. because they're the ones, you know, in the last 10 years we've heard uh, in uh, film theory that uh, the curator is actually creating a work of art. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, it, it sounded a little uh, obnoxious to me at first. Yeah. And then uh, I thought about it and I said, well, if they are creating the work of art, then they also have a responsibility in the same way the artist does. So the, the curator has the power uh, just as much as the artist, and in certain ways more than an artist does. Uh, so they definitely uh, can and should be encouraged to push the limits. Well, let's talk a bit about live film, because I thought that that was a very interesting aspect of Jack Smith's work, and also mm. I, I feel like that your practice as well yeah, yeah, yeah. revolves around that. And in the film, at some point, Jack Smith says that live film is sort of a solution for the fact that film is in a bankrupt state. Mm -hmm. So first of all, could you just elaborate a bit on the mm -hmm. concept of the, of the live film and then also just a bit reflect on if you think that film is still in a bankrupt state or right. it's moved into a different yeah. direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you have on one hand a uh, live film, and on the other you have what he called crustaceousness. Okay. And that is um, uh, when art becomes encrusted with yeah. mold and uh, barnacles, and suddenly it, it no longer has life. Yeah. All right? So he s sees crustaceousness and live film. And live film, on the other hand, is some, a cinema that is alive in the present moment and it's open to change, which is why he gave a different version every time he did a performance. Uh, it challenges the audience to step away from the normal structure. Um, for example, he would begin his performances three or four hours late so that the 10 people who showed up would be reduced to two. You know, it, uh, like, can you wait? Is, is waiting and boredom part of the process of coming to understand uh, a work of art in yeah. live film? It, it was all of these kinds of issues that pushed the, the limit yeah. uh, versus crustaceous art. Yeah. And he saw film, especially the independent or underground film at the time, as being crustaceous because it had lost the ability to engage the audience and then draw them in. I see. And do you think that film is still in a bankrupt state that we <laughs> talked about? Because I, I thought that that mm. was such an interesting way yeah. to yeah. put um, this. I, I don't think we have completely filed for bankruptcy, <laughs> but we have to be careful. Um, uh, it's, it's in danger of yeah. falling into that um, trap of catering and pandering to the audience all the time. And that, of course, is particularly so uh, when you look at online cinema and the opportunity to you know, stream works live and um, uh, you know, put art, whole archives of film material online and just cater to what the audience desire is. And that's the danger. Yeah. But I don't think we're bankrupt yet. Yeah, that's, that's good to hear for sure. Um, so knowing the personal history of Jack Smith mm -hmm. uh, and also watching these, these amazing images mm -hmm. on screen, sort of there is 
it's never really explicit, but there is this feeling or like this aura of of AIDS and HIV of, mm -hmm. of that crisis that mm -hmm. looms over yeah. over these these things. And uh, you took a really big part in through your art in fighting um, the hatred and ignorance of of the hegemonic society mm -hmm. with with this issue. Um, could you talk a bit about that? Because yeah. I think that would be very important. To yeah, yeah. Um, um, at the time, I made a, a trilogy of films, Aid Scream, Ece Homo, and Final Solutions. And it was at a time in America when there was only the most belligerent bigotry um, uh, practiced against uh, people with AIDS. and. When, in the American mind today, they look back on that era, what they see is that they were compassionate and helpful and wonderful, you know. And they forget that at the moment that uh, gay men needed them the most in San Francisco and New York, they turned their back. And the media was, as Barbara Hammer says in her film, Snow Job. They were, creating this snow job about AIDS, which, you know, is a, uh, an expression that describes a, basically a lie. And I made this trilogy of films to confront not only straight people, but also gay men, to understand that this was not a benign concern on the part of the medical industry. This was serious political intervention, you know, to attack and hopefully, in their minds, destroy gay politics. And um, uh, so I tried to get those films out as, as uh, urgently as I could. Um, in Jack Smith's work, and this is one of the things that I haven't read anything about, I mean, this is why I put it into the f my film. Jack created a, a live film performance called Ghosts and he based it on Ibsen's play. Yeah. Ibsen's play deals with venereal disease and the effect of a young man going off to the city, contracting venereal disease, and coming back into this uh, wretched house with his mother and, and family. And that was exactly the pattern that was enacted uh, during that era in the 80s. And Jack was attempting, through his own language, to communicate that. Uh, I just would add on that point that so much of Jack Smith's politics, political points of view, commentary on social issues and gender are all coded within a, uh, like a very personal uh, language. <clears throat> you know, rented island. Crustaceous, uh, Maria Montez, uh, Uncle Fishhook, and so on. If you decipher the codes, you'll see that he's making some serious political commentary. Yeah, certainly. Um, you had a very influential writing about gay sensibility, mm. and uh, and also. Uh, how and, and, and it also served as an inspiration for film festivals, yeah. especially for like queer film festivals. Um, can you talk about about this concept of the gay sensibility and mm. and how you see the relationship of this mm. with current film festivals and with the current film mm. festival <laughs> culture? Yeah, um, uh, <clears throat> the American um, gay liberationist Harry Hay. Uh, once said that um, we are told that gay people and straight people are uh, totally alike except for what we do sexually. Uh -huh. But Harry Hay said, I would say we are completely different and the only thing we have in common is what we do sexually. Uh -huh. That it's, it is not the sexual experience that differentiates us yeah. It's our world view. And taken in its full scope, that world view, um, I, I go back to Edward Carpenter, the American philosopher and writer. 
that worldview is to educate the masses, to bring what we today would call the queer vision to the world. Yeah. Right. Um, now I'm wondering because the film is very much concerned with the aesthetics of, of Jack Smith's work. Mm -hmm. And now we talk about gay sensibility and how um, it's the experience and the worldview that like differentiates from the hegemonic mm -hmm. heteronormative society. Uh, then I'm wondering if can we talk about a queer aesthetic in general? And like if we could, then what do you think what defines a queer mm -hmm. aesthetic? Okay. Beginning with the understanding that queer describes people of all genders who interact sexually with people of all genders, <laughs> okay? And that, that queer describes the world view. Yeah. Um, then I would say there is a sense of physicality as well as mental and even spirit um, uh, awareness, so physical, mental, spiritual awareness of the individual. And secondly, is a sense of being present rather than in the past or in the future. That, that, that art and life have to be experienced in the present. Yeah. All right. uh, so, uh, so these are, and these are only pointers toward what I would say is a queer sensibility. Yeah. Right. Uh, in the article that I wrote, yeah. um, I, I was 27 when I wrote it, and I had no idea that it meant anything. <laughs> uh, I just was writing about what I saw, and I thought, well, gee, you know, there are all of these uh, filmmakers who are gay, and um, they seem to have something in common. And um, I was working at the Millennium Film Workshop at the time, and uh, they were very open to publishing the article. So, um, but at, that article deals with more um, superficial uh, observations about the films of that era. But I think uh, now there we have broadened our. Uh, awareness and expanded our awareness and there's even more that could be written except my pen broke <laughs> <laughs> all right um, I was also wondering because you are such a, a major figure of queer cinema queer underground cinema mm. experimental cinema how do you see the current state of queer cinema mm. You mean I should be like a doctor and take its temperature? No, 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 no not necessarily. But like, what mm. what developments do you see there? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, um, it's exciting because um, uh, first there is a, a new technology that enables uh, all of us to see work uh, in various forms at various times, asynchronous, synchronous, yeah. you know, whatever. Um, and there is an interest in understanding where we came from. How did we get here? Yeah. And uh, the only thing I would say about looking at the past is don't romanticize it and don't become too attached to it okay. because um, we don't talk about all the horrible aspects of life in the past, but we, we learn about it and we move forward. And, but moving forward involves staying in the present. Um, I would say, generally, it's hopeful and optimistic, even in spite of the political situation in America. Um, <clears throat> but don't become focused on the past and um, deal with the present um, and hope for the best. I see. Well, I think that's a great message yeah. uh, for everybody. I would really like to thank you for the interview, you. for your time. And You're welcome. Uh, I wish you a very pleasant Ferlinale for the rest of the time. Thank you. Thank you.